And with that, I'm going to switch over and we'll actually run the Agapit program. So this is what our studio looks like. Um, down here you can see you can click on the packages tab and it lists all the packages that you have loaded in your libraries and if you want to load one all you have to do is click on so like this BLR one if you click on it it just automatically loads it you don't have to type any comment like any code or anything um, so we'll switch back over the plot window and then up here you know provides you with some tools that you can use like importing the data set which I'll show you in a second and then finally it stores your workspace images over here. So this is that beginning code that we need to run in order to initialize Gapit. And so we'll just highlight that and you can click run. And so you know you'll sometimes get these warnings and this is because I've ran it a few times before we actually did the webinar so this stuff's already loaded into uh, R for me. And so then you would do the install packages if you didn't already have these ones. And then finally, we'll use the library command to load all the stuff into our current session. And so we looks like we're good to go with that. And then so down here we have the source code, and you know this web address obviously tells Gapit where to find it. And then over here you see that it just loaded it all, and it's called the Gapit function. So um, this way you know you have the program loaded. And then we'll run the code to get Emma. And it should show up. You can see that the, all these Emma functions have been loaded as well. So this is good. We know that we have all the programs loaded. We know that we have gap it loaded. So now we just need to get our data. So like I said, we can go up to tools, do import data set. And again, mine's always from a text file. And so you can go through. Um, and let's see. So if you wanted to select, you know, you'd select numeric genotype file. And uh, Gap it will walk you through this. And it might have just, and uh, so I have to tell it whether or not it wants, you want a header on it and how it's separated. And then tell it to import it. But we are just going to use um, the command line. And then. So that loaded both of our files. And you can see that because in our data, you have HapMap Geno has been loaded, as well as the phenotype data. So at this point, we have all our data loaded. And what's nice, if you want to look at it, you can just click on it. It'll open a new window up here. And so you can see our taxa and our proteins for each line. Um, this is another great way to check to make sure things loaded right. Uh, to check the genotype data, Again, we can see that's been imported correctly. We have our markers here, our chromosome position. This information is still NAs, and then we have our genotype data. So this is what's kind of nice about our studios. It allows a limited graphical user interface compared to just regular R. So again, we'll just kind of run through here and check the structure of our data. Again, you see here the data frame, the number of observations, the variables, so we know we have taxa and protein, you know that taxa is a factor, uh, protein is numeric, it gives us those values, and then we'll just do a basic histogram, and again, you know, the data looks really nice, good distribution, it doesn't look like there's any major problems. Um, you know, these lines of code, again, just will give us those summary statistics, and finally, I, I do like using this which um, is NA. So that way I know, I roughly have an idea of how much missing data I have before I even start um, analyzing it. And so this way I can just make sure that um, nothing got loaded funny and that we have the right number of lines. So in terms of changing the directory to do the actual analysis, you can go up here to session and set working directory and then choose directory. At this point, um, you know, you can navigate to wherever, you know, you would just like click, click on this one, no compression, and hit select folder. And you can see down here in the console, it lets you know that it changed um, the working directory. So in this first analysis that we'll do, and that I explained in the presentation, um, 
that we're not going to use compression. We're just going to do a basic analysis. And, you know, so you type in gap it. Again, it's case sensitive. You know, parentheses, make sure you have commas after each line of code. And you can just highlight that and run it. And so RStudio, what's nice is if it's working and thinking, it gives you the stop sign so that you know it's doing its thing. Um, and so right here you can watch and it just kind of, you know, keep an eye on it as it's doing the analysis. And while it's doing it, that's, we can talk about not using compression. And so here's the code, for, again, for not using compression. Excuse me, for using it. This is the default settings. And so we've eliminated those lines of code. And like I said, Gapit um, automatically tries to group things by 10. If you want to use a different parameter, like maybe you think 100 is better, you know, try and group lines by, by hundreds, um, you can change that. And so you would run this, and it takes a little bit longer because, you know, it's trying to run the best analysis and, you know, mush all these lines together. And so down here you'll see that Gapit finished running. You'll see there are 17 warning messages, but don't fret. Um, if you actually look at the warnings, um, it's typically, it'll say like failure to remove some object. Um, this hasn't impacted your analysis and it should be fine. Um, and so the output that you will get um, is quite substantial. And so you'll see if for just this one trait, it generated all these files. I won't cover which each one is, but I guess that's why I caution you to make sure you change your directory so that, you know, you don't like put all this on your desktop or something. And then for comparison between compression and no compression, here are the top hits and their respective p-values. And so this is no compression used. You know, we got these ones, we turn compression on and our p-values got just a little bit smaller. In this one case, it got larger, which was kind of bizarre, but sometimes that happens. So that's just to give you a sense of, you know, so maybe some initial analyses that you should try. If we go down, here's this third analysis, and I've tried to write up enough about it that it'll be explanatory. But pretty much, you know, the input files are the same. The uh, genotype data imputation is the same. But this kinship cluster and kinship group, um, there's some different options that you can use. And so one of these is complete and ward, and I know I'm, you might be scratching your head as to what those are. Um, there's, um, you know, if you consult the manual, it'll tell you all the various options that you can use for clustering and for grouping. And then finally, um, I threw in this model selection bit of code. And this uses the Bayesian information criteria to select the optimal number of principal components to use in the model. And so if you run this, it actually turns out that um, the best model that fit didn't actually use any of the principal components. Um, it wasn't needed. And that's important because, you know, population structure varies from trait to trait, and therefore you don't always maybe need to use the same number of principal components for each trait. And so by having this model selection on, it kind of makes it nice in that it does some of the, you know, thinking for you. And it tries to find the best model for your data. And when it does that, that optimal compression file that I was talking about, it'll list those settings. And then so here is the output that we got this time. And you can see that our p-values actually got, you know, I would say a lot smaller. Not a lot, but smaller than they did when just using basic compression. Um, so look at that number and then, you know, we scroll up and, you know, you can see that we made quite, you know, some improvement. And so, you know, that improvement might be greater, it might be less depending on the trait that you're analyzing. So that's just one thing to consider when you're doing your analysis. And I can't stress it enough that the options of Gaffet are vast and that it just takes some time to maybe try a few things out and see what works best for your data. Um, this script file should have most information you need to run it and don't think that you need to run our studio to run all this. Um, I've checked numerous times and this code works just fine in regular R if you're more comfortable doing that. And so with that, um, 
that is all I have to say about Gapit, and I'd be happy to take any questions.